Good day. Today we are about to discuss the monastic supremacy in the Philippines by Marcelo H. Del Pilar. It has all started when the Spaniards had discovered and explored the Philippines. It was early in the 16th century when the Catholic missionaries and explorers from Spain have arrived here in the Philippines. It started with the Magellan's expedition uh, when they discovered the Philippines in 1521 and um, other uh, subsequent voyage, voyages like Villalobos and Loisa were undertaken for commercial, not exactly for missionary purposes, but by the hope of locating the Spice Islands for Spain. So here in the monastic supremacy here in the Philippines, so we will be dealing with uh, its political, religious, and economic aspect. But before we proceed into that, so here is our learning objective uh, for the day. First, we are about to define the roles of the church in the Philippines uh, during the 18th century. Second, we are about to discuss the Filipino cultures as a result of Spanish supremacy in the Philippines. And lastly, we are going to evaluate the country's progress by formulating our own insights um, during the Spanish or monastical supremacy in the Philippines. So as I mentioned earlier, so this, the monastic supremacy in the Philippines, it has been divided into three different aspects. First is political aspect, second is religious, and third is economic aspect. Here is the religious orders. The priors have started in working to widen beliefs. So the first to arrive in the country is the Augustinians in the year 1565 or the Order of Saint uh, Augustine. Second is the Franciscans, they arrived 1578 or uh, under the Order of Ordo Praterum Minorum. The Jesuits, Jesuits arrives uh, 1581 for the Society of Jesus, Dominicans 1587, Order of Preachers, and lastly the Recollects in 1606, Order of Augustinians and Recollect. The religious played a predominant role in the administration of the Philippines. Thus, it is the start of the monastic supremacy in the Philippines. The battles against invaders and the oppressors during the colonial Philippines were not only marked by the revolts but were also manifested in the writings of the Filipinos in Spanish. The writings of the propagandists like Marcelo H. Del Pilar in his work La Soberania Monacal and Pilipinas, which crimes and abuses of the priors and the injustice done were exposed. So without this write-ups or writings uh, from the pro propagandists and satirist Marcelo H. Del Pilar, we will not know what really happened during the time of um, the monastical era in the Philippines. So let us examine the life of Marcelo H. Del Pilar. Marcelo H. Del Pilar, he was a Philippine revolutionary propagandist and satirist. He was born in Kupang, Bulacan on August 30, 1850. He, is, he actively campaigned against the abuses of the priors or abuses of the Spanish priors in the Philippines. He, along with Jose Rizal and Graciano Lopez Jaina, 
they became known as the leading lights of the reform movement in Spain. He is commonly known for his pen name or pen names Plaridel, Siling Labuyo, and Dolores. Marcelo H. Del Filar, he studied at Colegio de San Juan, de de San Juan and later at the University of Santo Tomas where he finished his law course in 1880. In the year 1882, Marcelo H. Del Pilar founded the newspaper Jariong Tagalog that was uh, aimed to propagate demo democratic liberal ideas among the farmers and peasants. In the year 1888, he defended Jose Rizal's polemical writings against the priest attack. So, in the year 1889, he succeeded Graciano Lopez Jaina as the editor of the Filipino reformist periodical La Solidaridad in Madrid. Now, here is a picture of his book, La Soberania Monacal El uh, Filipinas. It was written by Marcelo Hilario Del Pilar. So now let us move forward with the term monastic supremacy. Monastic supremacy is equivalent into the service to God and into the service of the King of Spain. The church organization personnel, and role in society were all defined early in the colonial era. During the Spanish colonialization, the friars maintained complete control of secondary and higher instruction. As a result, they were deeply implicated in the exploitation of Filipino transfiring to the different transformative effects in the lives of the Filipino people in different aspects, maybe in political, into religious, and economic aspect. They contribute so much in those aspects. So now let us um, proceed with the political aspect of the monastical supremacy in the Philippines. The priors, the priors interfered in the, in the Philippine government for a long time. It was firmly established. Thus, without any difficulty, they controlled the status quo of the country in defiance of the nation and the institution. The moderating power of the parish priests may be useful to society to balance and harmonize the interest of the people and the institution. So the monastical power or the parish priests or even the curates is the mediator between the people and the institution during that time. To frighten the government with the rebelliousness of the country and frighten the country with the nepotism of the government. So that was the main function or main role of the monastical power or the parish priest or curate in the country. The lack of unity between people and government is the foundation of monastic wealth which must be fostered by fueling the first hatred and second authoritarianism. The best method to keep ruler, rulers and rule in permanent enmity is to account for diversity of languages among rulers and ruled. Here is an example, a picture of cedula personal. A cedula personal, it is a form of taxation used during the Spanish colonial era in the Philippines that serves as a proof 
that a particular person handling this per cedula persona is in the colony of Spain and a member of a certain pueblo in the Philippines. To perpetuate that diversity, to obstruct education, and to avoid at all costs that people and government came to understand one another. So now let us proceed into the religious aspect of the monastical era or monastical supremacy in the Philippines. Despite the Philippines having a government who are responsible for all duties served for the Filipinos during the time of performance of their duties only depends on the parish priest. So that is why the, municip the municipal official depends on the parish priest to conduct the citizens' census of residents, conscription of eligible young men, formalizing accounts, and official documents. The important of the important requisite for everything is the curate's signature. So if your document or paper has a signature of the curate, that means that document is very valid because the um, government official or even the municipal officials is relying only in the curates. So that is why uh, during that era or during that time, when you have the signature of curate, you are you 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 are having the most important document during that time because it is approved by the curate or the parish priest. The guarantee of national integrity can be in the priors and not in the church. The national integrity is at stake during this period, and they were very authoritative. So since the curate or the parish priest is more superior than the municipal official um, there was a time that the curate or the, the parish priest were very authoritative and came into power so that is why national integrity is at least at stake at that time the, the decisive plan of the priors offers advantages to monastic exploitation, it geopardizes the future of the Philippines was well as the highest interest of both countries. So let us proceed with the economic aspect of the monastical power in the Philippines. The government restrained from creating a new sources of revenue. So it will not add any burden to the Filipinos anymore. But the priors, the, the priests and bishops therefore constituted a solid, powerful, permanent, well-organized political force in the islands which dominated policies. They have invented any forms that is costly and ha that will make the public pay. Unfortunately, Filipinos are left with no choice to pay against their will. The laws that regulates the foundation and development of convents in the Philippines are undoubtedly based on the belief of monastic life is unproductive. This is due to that um, the Spanish colonial era or government in the Philippines established different forms of um, taxation or policies, one of which is the tributes. So the tributes is the indigenous family had to cultivate food for the sustenance, not, for, not limited only for their family, but for the landlords as well. Second, the bandala. Bandala requires the native farmers to sell their goods to the government. So the native farmers were only allowed to sold or to sell 
their goods only to the government at the at a lower price. Cedula personal. A cedula personal is a form of taxation that serves as a piece of paper which was issued as a proof that one is a colony of Spain and a member of a pueblo. Polo is our bisho. This one is a forced labor uh, for 40 days that includes uh, men from, from ages 18 to 60 years old to conduct a uh, service for the welfare or for the establishment of different classes, municipalities, and even the convents as a project of the Spanish colonial era here in the Philippines. The establishment of government monopoly. In the establishment of government monopoly, so during the Spanish colonial time in the Philippines, um, there was a tobacco monopoly uh, where Filipinos instruct only to plant tobaccos for the Spanish or the for the Philippines to supply its tobacco to the Span to the European region, particularly in the in the in the Spain, uh, because there is a uh, demand so much high demand on the tobacco. The Philippines government lack of resources to undertake public courts. So, uh, during the Spanish colonial era, at that time, the government is having a problem because they are lack, lacking on the resources for them to be able to undertake public works. While the monastic orders build grand and costly convents and spacious palaces for their residents, of regular curates so that is why how monastic orders is more powerful than the government at that time the government established primary schools in each town the government houses are made on light materials but the prior curates has has stable palaces The government finds a thousand thousand obstacles in collect, collecting taxes from the tax paying public, but the monastic order empty without the difficult the purse of the same public in return for uh, heavenly promises. So as I, as I have mentioned earlier, the priors, priests, and bishops. Constitution, constituted a powerful, solid, permanent, and well-organized political force in the islands that dominate the policies. They invented many or any reforms or any forms that is costly and will make public to pay in return of heavenly promises. The government worries about financial needs but the monastic treasurers or has an overflowing with money the government refrains creating new resources of revenue while the priors invent every day new form of devotion some are very costly and the public pay because of fear of displacing the priors the amortization of land is paid out to agriculture everywhere. Experienced economics have shown the needs of for this entailed or um, this restrict property. One source of income of monastic orders is the trade in religious objects. So before we we have this conclusion, so during the um, monastic supremacy in the Philippines, particularly in the economic aspect, 
there was a repugnant, repugnantly, they have acquired these lands over time by purchasing with unreasonable prices ecclesia, ecclesiastical privileges at times outright absorption. There are means of acquisition, like for instance, royal bequests. A royal bequest, the priors suggested that the king grant the same states in the native villages to some missionaries could become self-supporting. Second, donation and inheritance. A donation to priors is gratitude for their ministrations. Priests were prohibited from inheriting property from those they habitually con confess by order of the king. Third, uh, buying of lands. Buying of lands, priors of lands from native using the money obtained from the church, uh, like for instance, the fees, trade, and from profits gained from the produce of lands. With their prestige of power, they pressured natives into to sell their lands at the very low prices. For close and for close of mortgages, natives lack capital for extensive cultivation, so partnership was formed between the farmers and priors herein the priors provided capital while the farmers worked on the fields. Prior began to demand that their advan advances be regarded as loans payable at a time rate of interest. The farmers' debt ran into debt leading to foreclose of lands. And lastly, the land grabbing. This is an additional hectare of land outside the original boundaries of priors property were grabbed were gobbled up each time a new survey was conducted priests claimed lands and had them titled original native settlers were now declared squatters as a conclusion our fellow filipinos have experienced in the hands of the Spaniards, they were treated unfair and insufferable. Yes, the Spaniards, uh, they should be credited for few things they contributed to our country. But it is still undeniable that Filipinos at that time suffered a lot and have been deprived of their own rights and justice. I will agree with the description of Marcelo H. Del Pilar of the Priors. They are not servant of gods. They use religion just to earn. Uh, that's the end of our session uh, today. So please uh, reserve your questions for our asynchronous meeting. So thank you so much for listening and have a good day.